I mean, Isaiah 13. One of the greatest books of the whole Bible. 66 chapters in Isaiah coinciding with the 66 books of the Bible. And we've made it to Isaiah chapter 13. And I'm going to talk about things that are associated with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is one of those chapters that just will make you in awe of the word. Isaiah 13 and verse 1 says, The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Now, not the Am not Amos the prophet. This is a different Amos. This is a A-M-O-Z Amos, not a A-M-O-S. But the first thing associated with the second coming is men with a burden. Isaiah has a burden. And it's the burden of Babylon, historically, He's talking about Babylon back then, but prophetically, he's talking about a Babylon in the future. So the burden is a prophecy that Isaiah has to get off of his chest. He's got a burden on his chest. And in Jeremiah 20 and verse 9, it describes it as a burning fire shut up in his bones. So Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty, has some men with a burden. And they have to speak the oracles of God and get it off their chest or they'll just go insane. When it comes to the second coming, you have preachers preaching it from Genesis to Revelation. They got a burden on their chest. Enoch did it back in Genesis 5. It says so in the book of Jude. Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all their ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He was having a burden way back then. Uh, John has a burden all the way through the book of Revelation. And then you got thousands of preachers teachers, Christians today with this burden on their chest about the second coming. So Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw it. He saw this burden. It says, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. He saw it with his own two eyes. Isaiah, the son of, son of Amos, saw this burden. He saw it with his own two eyes, just like the apostle John saw the events of Revelation play out. The second coming is associated with men with the burden. There's been people burdened with it from Genesis to Revelation. Isaiah 13, 2 says, Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. That would be Zion. Exalt the voice unto them. You know, get louder. Exalt the voice. Shake the hand. I, I guess that would be give a signal. To have them go in, possibly. That they may go in into the gates of the nobles. Into the gates of Jerusalem to reign. You know, when the church comes back with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to exalt his voice unto them. It says, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. We're going to be like an army with banners. Remember back there in Song of Solomon 6.10. It says, who is she that looketh forth as the morning? Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. So lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. Imagine riding through there on your white horse, carrying a flag, a banner, that says Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. The second coming should be a burden on your chest that you have to talk about or you're just going to blow up. But the problem is most Christians don't even know what the second coming is. They don't know what's happening at the second coming. They, get, they don't even know the difference between the rapture and the second coming. But it's associated with men with the burden. Number two, it's associated with mighty ones. Mighty ones and sanctified ones. Isaiah 13, 3 says, I have commanded my sanctified ones. The Lord's commanded his sanctified ones. He says, I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. So this is so clear. 
The saints coming back on white horses are his sanctified ones. The mighty ones could also reference the mighty angels. And Jude, verse 14, Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Deuteronomy 33, 2, And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. So we come down in his anger. And this is 6,000 years worth of vengeance that the Lord's going to open up on the world. We are his sanctified ones that come down with him at the second coming. And 2 Thessalonians, verses one, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8, uh, 10. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's why I say those mighty ones might be those mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall, become, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. And to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Note the phrase, in that day, put you in a second coming context, just like the day of the Lord. He's coming with his sanctified ones. He's coming with his mighty ones for his anger. Even them that rejoice in his highness. So, Second coming associated with men with a burden, mighty ones. Number three, it's associated with the multitude in the mountains. In Isaiah 13, 4, it says, The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. It's a multitude in the mountains. It's a mustered up host for the battle now you're going to find isaiah 13 is a great match with joel chapter 2 and if you've been listening to me a while you know i always go back to joel chapter 2 one of the greatest chapters on the second coming of the lord jesus it describes me and you coming back with jesus at the second coming it's not the locust army it's me and you coming back joel 2 1 blow you the trumpet in zion there's your trumpet. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. There's that mountain. A multitude in the mountains. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. There's the fear that we're going to talk about. The fear of the people that they're going to feel. For the day of the Lord. There's your day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess. We're going to talk about that. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains. It's a multitude in the mountains. A great people. You see? Not just as a great people, but a great people. It's not the locust army. A great people and a strong. There hath not ever been the like. Neither shall be any more after it. Even to the years of many generations... Now, Joel 2, 3, a fire devoureth before them. We're going to talk about that fire. And behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Nobody's getting away. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. We come back on white horses. And as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise. Here's your noise. The multitude makes making a noise in the mountains. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. See, it's not just the saints, a part of the multitude making a noise. But there's also going to be another army. Sinners gathered together against them making a noise. It's going to be a loud time. Zephaniah 3.8 
says, Therefore wait ye upon me, said the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. There's that anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. There's your fire. So you see, his determination is to gather the nations, get them together to wipe them all out. He's coming down from the clouds with his army to go against all the nations gathered together. Revelation 16, 12 through 14. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So he dries up a river just so they can get together faster. And it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. There's a dragon we're going to talk about. And out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. There's your day of God Almighty. There's your battle with people gathered together. Revelation 19, 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sit on the horse and against his army. So, you're going to have a multitude in the mountains making a noise. Isaiah 13, 4. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as a, of a great people, a tumultuous noise, the kingdoms of nations gathered together, the nations gathered together. The Lord gets the enemies together, the Lord gets us together. And it's going to be the biggest battle you ever saw. Isaiah 13, 5. Now, the next thing is mass destruction. You got mighty ones. You got multitude in the mountains. You got mass destruction. Isaiah 13, 5. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. So the far country, obviously, that's the third heaven. That's a far country from the end of heaven. The earth is a far country from the third heaven, and the third heaven is a far country to us. And the Lord talks about it in the Gospels all the time. You see that far country. And salvation in the Word of God is good news from a far country. But if you are one of the Antichrist-worshipping people on earth at the second coming, it's bad news from a far country. There's going to be a mass destruction that's going to take place. If you're Babylon, you're in for it. But let me show you the Lord and his army leaving that far country to come down. One of the greatest chapters on the second coming in the whole Bible, Revelation 19, starting in verse 11. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Right there is your armies leaving a far country to come down. Isaiah 13, 5 talks about the weapons of his indignation. Now, this is mass destruction, so those weapons of his indignation are weapons of mass destruction. And what are some of these weapons he's going to have at his fingertips? Well, a sharp two-edged sword, a rod of iron, horse's hooves, a threshing machine, a flamethrower, you see all these things associated with the second coming? Revelation nineteen fifteen, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. There's one of those weapons of mass destruction. That with it he should smite the nations. Those nations that are gathered together against him. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. It's going to be like a threshing machine with a flamethrower attached to the front. Habakkuk 3.12 
Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. In Isaiah 13, 6, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. There's your day of the Lord. Automatically puts you in that second coming or millennium context. The day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the almighty mass destruction. Watch that phrase, day of the Lord. And it says, howl ye. It's going to sound like it's going to sound like millions of your neighbor's dogs that keep you up all night. It's going to be so loud. What a nightmare. It is a destruction from the Almighty. Who is the Almighty? The Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So you're going to have mass destruction. Next, you're going to have melted hearts. Isaiah 13, 7. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. Hands will be faint. You ever been so scared you couldn't even use your hands? Ever get so scared you, you thought your heart might come out of your backside? Luke 21, 26 through 28 says, Men's hearts failing them for fear. Going to have a heart attack. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. So men's hearts filling them for fear. Every man's heart shall melt. Everyone has something that their flesh is afraid of. In Christ... I'm not afraid. And there's a place that you can go in your transformed mind that you're not afraid of anything, keeping your mind on the Lord, you see? But most times your flesh just freaks out. You know, anytime I get up high, really high, my hands get sweaty. I get this feeling in my flesh of dread. You know, some people are bothered by heights. Some people are bothered by spiders. Some by snakes. Some by dogs. My flesh hates the sight of Hairless cats. When I see a hairless cat, I get the same feel feeling as when I see a, a, a huge snake or a Komodo dragon or something. To me, a hairless cat just puts me in mind of an unclean spirit. You see, your, your flesh is a, is a scaredy cat. You have to get all your boldness from the Lord. Without the Lord, you're just a scaredy cat. And the lost armies at the second coming don't have the Lord. So when Jesus Christ comes back, they don't have no, no place to go in their mind. They don't have no place to rest from their fear. Because Jesus Christ is the only true rest from fear. And he's coming to kill you. So when Jesus Christ comes back. They will be running for the dens and holes of the rocks. With their tail between their legs. Revelation 6, 15 through 17. And the kings of the earth. And the great men. And the rich men. And the chief captains. And the mighty men. And every bondman. And every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, they're hiding, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? There's your great day, the day of the Lord. Isaiah 13, 8. And they shall be afraid. The tables have turned. The serial killers become the victim. The bullies get bullied. Them that kill with the sword get killed with the sword. At the advent, the bullies get bullied. There's always somebody bigger, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. So, hearts are going to melt. Melted hearts. Next, much pain. Much pain. Isaiah 13, 8. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain. As a woman that travaileth. You seen your wife have a baby before? You seen how much agony she was in? That's what God compares this time to. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. When the Lord describes this time, he describes it as like a woman giving birth to her child. First Thessalonians 5, 2 through 3. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord 
So cometh as a thief in the night, when they shall say, Peace and safety. Then sudden destruction, mass destruction, cometh upon them, mass travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Remember, Joel 2 said, Nothing shall escape them. Isaiah 13, 8 said, Their faces shall be as flames. That's a match with Joel chapter 2 again. Joel 2, 5 through 6. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains. There's your multitude on the mountains making a big noise. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. As a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be. Here's the phrase. Much pained. There's going to be much pained. But then look at this. All faces shall gather blackness like a nu nuclear blast going off in their face. Zechariah 14, 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. A big blast goes off in their face. Nam 2.10. She is empty and void and waste. The heart melteth. Men's hearts fell in them for fear. Melted hearts. And the knees smite together. And here's the phrase. Much pain is in all loins. And the faces of them all gather blackness. Much pain. Their faces shall be as flames. Isaiah 13.8. Next, mercy has run out, anger has come in, Isaiah 13, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, there's your day of the Lord, both with cruel, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Zephaniah 2, 1 through 3. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. See, it's a day of anger. No more mercy. Not Jesus coming as a friend of publicans and sinners. It's Jesus coming in a vengeance. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his, his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. God is angry with the wicked every day, Psalm 7, 11. Why not call on him while he is reaching out his hand of mercy? Why let the day of anger come and you not be saved? The chances of you even making it that far are slim. The next thing is moon, stars, and sun. Are darkened you see we're not looking for signs in the heavens for the rapture this has to do with the second coming in Isaiah 13 10 it says for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light the Sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine and you see this in so many other places I couldn't Probably can't even name them all to you. Like, but once again, it's going to match Joel chapter 2. In Joel 2.10, it says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Joel 3.15 and 16, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. You'll see that again here in a minute. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And then Matthew 24, the great chapter on the tribulation, when the disciples say, what's going to be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he goes on to describe it, and he eventually gets to Matthew 24, 29, and 30, where it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, Notice, it's not calling that time period the tribulation. It says, after the tribulation of those days. You know, even though we call it the tribulation, really that's not the title. It's more of a description 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. There's that howling going on, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. There's those clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Then in Mark 13, 24, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. So, you know, you could keep going on. And I don't know if the moon and the stars and the sun are darkened by reason of the multitudes and armies coming out of the heavens, or if the Lord does something to them to make them not give their light, but it's going to be a day of darkness and gloominess, as Joel chapter 2 describes. And remember, the Lord cometh with clouds maybe them clouds block out the light and darken the land like a giant mothership covering a city but if this is no interest to you you need to think about this for a minute this is your future if you're saved and it could be your future if you're not saved if you even survive that much of the tribulation to make it to the second coming you need to think about these things think about where you're going when you die think about your future here quit just living in the moment of fun and pleasure you're living in and think about the future but the moon and the sun and the stars are going to be darkened and the next thing the mighty men are going to be brought low isaiah thirteen eleven, and i will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity and i will cause the arrogancy of the proud to seize and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible you know a lot of people, arrogant, proud, haughty. They think that they're hot stuff. They think they're all that. They think that they're more than just a big animated mud ball, but that's all that they are. And people like that, that's the one that the, those are the ones the Lord's going to be mowing down at the second coming. And see, this goes beyond Babylon into the future, obviously, because it says... I will punish the world for their evil. He's going to humble the haughty. He's going to have those mighty men hiding in the dens and rocks of the mountains and praying, fall on us and hide us from the face of the Lamb and the one sitting on the throne. And he says in Isaiah 13, 12, and he says, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man from the golden wedge of Ophir. There's going to be so many men killed that they will be few and far between. So many men killed that they will be more precious than gold because they will be so rare. To find a man, it'll be, they'll be on high demand. And remember back there in chapter 4, there's going to be so few men that seven women will be willing to marry one man. Back there in Isaiah 4, 1, it says, And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our approach. Are you, str are you struggling ha getting a girlfriend? You're just living in the wrong dispensation. If you was living in this time, this future time that's coming, and you're still alive, you're going you're gonna to find a girlfriend easy. You may get seven of them. But this says, I will make a man more precious than fine gold. Even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Pure gold. A man's going to be more precious than that. They're going to be on high demand. The next thing. The Lord's going to be moving the earth out of her place. Isaiah thirteen thirteen. He says, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place, and the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Remember back there in Joel 2, it says, The earth shall quake before them when that army comes out of heaven. And those mighty men are going to be hiding in those rocks and those dens and rocks of the mountains. They're just going to be crushed by, by the rocks during the earthquake. There's nowhere to hide. Nothing shall escape them. Most likely, the Lord moves the earth back to its place that it was at before the flood. When men were living 900 years, when he shakes the earth, 
And that's one of the reasons why the long lifespans come back in the millennium. And a child's going to die a hundred years, it says. Meaning, you know, you're a hundred years old, you're going to be considered a child dying. Isaiah 13, 14. And it shall be as the chaste roe, and as a sheep that no man taketh up. The Lord's not going to be their shepherd. He's going to be the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, coming to eat them up. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee everyone into his own land. They'll be running away with their tail between their legs. Everyone that is found, remember, nothing shall escape them. No place to hide. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through. And everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Everyone that is found. Over there in Joel 2, it says, nothing shall escape them. And this says they're going to fall by the sword. There's that sharp two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. You might as well go ahead and let the Lord pierce you right now with the sharp two-edged sword and make you realize your guilt of sin and come to God broken and let these words stab you. Let these words of this sharp two-edged sword stab you and you come to God now and get saved so you don't have to face this horrible time period. And Isaiah thirteen sixteen. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. And somebody said, well, you're saying this is uh, this is the second coming. Well, what about this with these, you know, these children being dashed to pieces and the, the houses spoiled and the women, you know, ravished, women raped? Well, we're not just talking prophetical second coming. We're also talking historical. Here we're talking, got to be talking historical, speaking of what will happen to the enemy by wicked men during the, the destruction of Babylon, or even prophetically, what will take place, wicked men doing this to other wicked people during that time. You know, you have to, you know, use common sense along with it. We know that, you know, the Lord's not going to be doing those type of horrible things at the second coming, yeah, he's going to be having to kill. It's a righteous war taking place. And note that, a righteous war. The, these are things that happen of a, during an unrighteous war, you see. When they dash the, you know, an unrighteous war, you get a, a wicked people and a wicked army. They'll take the kids and they'll, they'll uh, pick them up and they'll bust them up against rocks or the side of a, a building and and just beat them to pieces or they'll go uh, into somebody's house and rape their wives you know that's things that a uh, unrighteous nation does in an unrighteous war jesus christ is coming back uh, as a righteous god doing a righteous warfare so and and just look at the context too because the next verse says the medes so it's showing you it's going, it's it's historical stuff mixed with prophetical stuff, and that but it brings us to our next point: the Medes are pale in comparison. And Isaiah thirteen seventeen, behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, and the Medes are nothing compared to the Lord and His army. But the Medes are not going to regard silver, it says, and as for gold, they're not going to delight in it. And you see the Medes took over Babylon, but they're pale in comparison to the Lord's army. And you can see over there in uh, Daniel 5, 27 through 28, where it said, Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Babylon, historically, gets taken over by the Medes and Persians. The Medes wouldn't regard silver or gold. You couldn't buy them. You couldn't bribe them. Same goes with the Lord's army. He's coming to take what's his. You're not going to be able to bribe him. And then Isaiah 13, 18. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. You see, the Medes taking over wouldn't have any mercy on the enemy. Whether it be the fruit of the womb, their eyes not going to spare children. They'll dash the children to pieces, rape the women. Isaiah 13, 19, In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of their, their excellency, the best things they got, it's just going to go up in smoke. Remember what the Lord did to Sodom and Gomorrah. He rained down fire and brimstone. The beauty of their excellency, the best things they got, they're going to be overthrown. Isaiah 13, 20. It shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither should the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Now this has to go back to being prophetic again because people dwell there now. And they will again. So this has to be speaking of a future time. But it says, But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there. And their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. And owls shall dwell there. And satyrs shall dance there. Doleful creatures. Creatures, animals that make a sorrowful sound. The owls are going to dwell there. That make that spooky sound you hear at night. Owls associated with dragons and satyrs in the scriptures. And they're likened to unclean spirits. Unclean birds are like unclean spirits. It talks them about them hanging around that literal lake of fire that's going to be on the earth over in Isaiah 34, 9 through 11. It says in Isaiah 13, 21, But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. And satyrs are devils that are half man and half goat. You, uh, you probably heard about that if you've seen the mythology stuff but this shows you this isn't just flesh and blood creatures inhabiting babylon but unclean spirits as well revelation 18 2 mentions this where it says and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying babylon the great is fallen is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird and over in Isaiah 34, 14, it mentions those uh, satyrs again, where it says, And the satyr shall cry to his fellow. So the Bab Babylon will have devils there, where those satyrs will sing and dance. And Isaiah 13, 22 says, And the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate, desolate houses. That's houses with no inhabitant. And dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come. And her days shall not be prolonged. Notice dragons. Just like there's one devil but many devils, there's one great dragon but many dragons. And it says Babylon's days are not going to be prolonged. And you think about that. If you are lost, your days are not going to be prolonged. And your time is near to come. You're going to meet your maker. You're going to stand before God Almighty. And you don't want to have the same fate as Babylon, that wicked place. You want to get right with God, get saved while you still can. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. He shed his blood for you. And all you got to do to be saved is come to him and accept the payment that he made on the cross. It says in Romans ten thirteen, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.